welcome to our last Humanities Forum presentation of this semester. My name is Scott Casper. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. But more important for today, I am also a professor in the History Department. And so I am particularly pleased to have been asked to introduce this program by Professors Ann Rubin and Kelly Bell. Both are associate professors here at UMBC, Anne in the Department of History, and Kelly in the Department of Visual Arts. I'll tell you a little bit about each of their backgrounds and then turn it over to them. Anne Rubin is, in addition to being associate professor of history, also director of the Center for Digital History and Education here at UMBC. Her undergraduate degree is from Princeton. She got her PhD at the University of Virginia where she began working with digital history before most of us even knew digital history existed. She was a co-author of one of the very first projects in digital history, and still, I think, the premier digital project in Civil War digital history, the Valley of the Shadow Project. Her first book, A Shattered Nation, The Rise and Fall of the Confederacy, 1861 to 1868, won the Organization of American Historians Avery O. Craven Prize for the most original book in the history of the Civil War era, an enormous accomplishment. And her brand new book, which is just out in the last couple of months, is Through the Heart of Dixie, Sherman's March in American Memory. I can attest, and I think my students here today might well agree, that it's a really good read and that Ann Rubin knows more about I think more than anybody else alive, about the stories people have told about Sherman's March from 1864 to 2014. 150 years of stories in every form, from film to fiction to history, you name it. Anne Rubin has researched it and knows it, and this book shows that. Kelly Bell is an extraordinary graphic designer who received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Pratt Institute and her MFA, MFA from here at UMBC, and in between had a very successful career as a graphic designer in New York, California, and Maryland, and her own consultancy firm right here in Baltimore. Her many projects include exhibitions of her work all up and down the mid-Atlantic mid region from New York to Baltimore and everywhere in between, including a solo exhibition at the Creative Alliance at the Patterson and two exhibitions at the Bromo Seltzer Arts Tower downtown in Baltimore, one of which in 2011 was named the best public art project by Baltimore Magazine. She has received awards from the Maryland State Arts Council and from the National Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. I would add that she is one of the most innovative, creative thinkers I have met since coming to UMBC. And, and that's, not say, that's not a small compliment given how many innovative, creative thinkers we have here. Today, Kelly and Anne will be talking about, and I think publicly launching, the innovative, smart website that they have created in conjunction with Ann Rubin's new book. And the website is called Mapping Memory, Sherman's March in America. And without any further introduction, I am pleased to give you Ann Rubin and Kelly Bell. You guys, should I use this mic or the, this mic? Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm loud. Naturally. Um, thank you so much, Scott, for that very kind introduction. And at the risk of this sounding like I've just won an Oscar, we actually, Kelly and I, have very many people to thank. Um, we started working together on this project around 2008 or 2009, and we've accrued a lot of debts along the way. So we first of all, of course, want to thank the Drescher Center, not just for hosting this event, but also for helping fund some of the project. We'd like to thank the Departments of History and of Visual Arts. We'd like to thank the IRC. Um, we'd like to thank Vice President for Research, Jeff Summers, who gave us some money at a critical time. And we'd also like to thank, we've got a, a double dean situation today, so we'd like to thank Dean John Jeffries um, for his support when he was leading the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Okay, so. In the summer of 1963, John Lewis, the recently elected chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, 
found himself writing the most important speech of his life. He would be speaking, along with other civil rights leaders, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as part of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Lewis wanted his speech to show the students frustration at the slow pace of social change, to show anger, even militancy. And so he warned, the time will come when we will not confine our marching to Washington. We will march through the South, through the heart of Dixie, the way Sherman did. We shall pursue our own scorched earth policy and burn Jim Crow to the ground nonviolently. 99 years after William Tecumseh Sherman led his 62,000 men out of Atlanta towards the sea and then up through the Carolinas, leaving devastation in their wake, the power of that event still resonated. 99 years later, the image of the march still angered, for at the last minute, John Lewis was asked to remove that sentence among a few others that were deemed too inflammatory, to take these out of his speech. And he ultimately did, making the changes in the very shadow of the Lincoln statue, even as the early speeches were going on. Sherman's March. The name conjures up a host of images and references, myths and metaphors for Americans. We think of Rhett and Scarlet, silhouetted against the flames of Gone with the Wind, of lone chimneys standing sentinel, all that remained of destroyed plantations. We think of soldiers stealing hams and chicken, silver and jewelry. We think of war as hell and 40 acres and a mule and the birth of total war. I argue that Sherman's March was the most symbolically powerful aspect of the American Civil War. And it's one that's come to dominate our cultural understanding of the war. It stands for devastation and for destruction, fire and brimstone, war against civilians. It's, it's almost like the Civil War in microcosm. And the march has been memorialized in fiction and film. It's been used as a metaphor to explain American involvement in Vietnam and one man's doomed search for romance. It's been employed as a metaphor for the burned out South Bronx of the 1970s and for gerrymandered electoral districts. Now dozens and dozens of historians have written about various aspects of Sherman's march, the military and the strategic, the impact that the war had on female civilians, the role the march played in bringing news of emancipation. They've written about the lives of Sherman's soldiers and of course about Sherman himself. What I do in my book and through the heart of Dixie is take a different approach. And rather than exclusively retell the story of the march, what I try to do is explore the myriad ways that Americans have remembered and retold and reimagined Sherman's march. And although the title is Sherman's March and American Memory, I actually argued a lot with the press over that title because I don't really like the, that. I don't like the memory piece. Um, increasingly, as I worked on the book, I came to think of it not about memory because when we think about memory, we often, there's often a kind of value judgment or a presumption that there's the truth and there's the memory and they're not always the same. Um, what I wanted to do instead was look at it in terms of stories and storytelling. Why are certain stories told over and over again? Why do other stories fall by the wayside? And what I really wanted to do was not try to figure out, okay, this story is true and this story is false, but instead to think about what, is, what do the stories mean? How do these stories layer together? Where do we get when we, when we think about it that way? So that's what I try to do. I want to give you a little bit of background and, and set up the scene for you. Um, imagine, if you will, it's the fall of 1864. It's late in the war. Confederates are losing ground all over. Um, up in the, the sort of, I don't know if this has a pointer. Oh, it does, but I'm terrible at using it. Kind of up there, <laughs> up there is um, in the north, in Virginia, you have Lee Stymied outside, Stymied, sorry, 
is what happens when I don't actually have it written down. You have Grant's Union Army is facing Lee's Confederate Army outside of Petersburg. They're actually fighting in trenches in a real foreshadowing of World War I. Um, at the same time, in Georgia, Sherman has just taken control of the city of Atlanta. He took control of it on September 2nd. And pretty quickly after he occupied Atlanta, Sherman decided to evacuate the city's civilian population. He wanted Atlanta to be a purely military base. He didn't want to have to deal with feeding civilians. He didn't want to have to worry about guarding from guerrilla attacks by civilians. Um, he doesn't want to have to worry about spies. He also knows he's not staying in Atlanta. And so he also doesn't want to have to leave any soldiers behind to hold on to the city. Um, he's criticized roundly for this move to evacuate the civilians. Um, and he famously, in response to this criticism, writes in a letter to the mayor of Atlanta that war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. And as a result of this, about 1,600 whites and several thousand African Americans pack up what they have and they literally hit the roads and take the trains out of the city of Atlanta. His next move was to make Georgia howl, as he put it, to march across Georgia. It's about 285 miles to Savannah. He wants his army to live off the land and destroy everything that could possibly aid the Confederacy. And part of the reason that he's doing this, it's for a few reasons. One, he wants to get to the coast, where it'll be easier to get supplies. The other reason is, frankly, this area of Georgia has not been hit hard by the war up until this point. And one thing that's really striking is how, um, how much food people had stored up. Because Sherman's men, as they talk about the march, are constantly talking about the variety of food they have to eat. And civilians are constantly complaining about all the different kinds of food that are taken from them. And so this is really, at this point, there's more food here than any place else in the Confederacy. And so Sherman, by taking it to feed his army, by destroying whatever they can't carry, is making sure that that food cannot go north to support the army in Virginia. Normally when I do this kind of talk, I have longer than I do today, and so I go through a lot of detail. Let me just give you a couple of really broad outlines of Sherman's march. Um, it's actually two campaigns. There's the March to the Sea from Atlanta to Savannah, which takes place in November and December of 1864. And then the army marches up from Savannah up through the Carolinas in um, February, March, and April of 1865. So it's really two campaigns. We, we sometimes forget that. Um, the army was made up of 62,000 men, 218 regiments. There were, I think, 54 just from Sherman's home state of Ohio. And they marched in two wings, in two columns. And, and in some ways, this is actually a terrible map to use because it illustrates exactly what I argue against, which is it shows the march. We'll make it work. It's a teachable moment. It shows the march as a lawnmower stripe, right? This 50 mile wide lawnmower stripe. It's not that. It's actually four separate columns two main columns, the left wing and the right wing, that are then further subdivided. So when you think about it, don't think about it as a lawnmower stripe. I, I, the metaphor that I like to use is it's stitches. It's rows and rows of stitches. So there are spaces in between, which means there are some places that are hit very hard by Sherman's March, and there are some places that it just sort of passes right by. Um, OK. It is, of course. Um, incredibly destructive. What you see here are soldiers ripping up railroad ties, and then what they would do is heat them up in, in giant fires and twist them. They called them Sherman's neckties or Sherman's necklaces. The men marched about 10 miles a day, which was very easy marching for these kind of veterans. You could expect them to march 20 or even 25 miles a day. They were authorized to, quote, forage liberally on the country, to seize food and to seize livestock. They left all kinds of devastation and destruction in their wake. They burned barns and cotton gin houses. Um, some private homes were destroyed, mostly in South Carolina, more in South Carolina than any other state. Um, 
they took food, they killed the animals they couldn't carry with them. Um, they, the men, the foragers, took on this epithet. They had been known as, they were called bummers, which before Sherman's March is really um, kind of a skulker, or somebody who's, who's lazy. Um, but they take this epithet, bummers, on as a point of personal pride and start calling themselves the bummers. So um, they captured three state capitals. Oops, this one's a little early. They captured three state capitals, uh, Milledgeville, the capital of Georgia, Columbia, which they also burned, or was burned more accurately, and ultimately Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, this is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, they reach Savannah just before Christmas time. They actually take the city of Savannah on December 22nd, and, and Sherman famously telegraphs Lincoln that he's presenting him a Christmas gift, which is, in fact, the city of Savannah. Um, they did not fight a lot. This is them marching through the swamps in South Carolina. This is Columbia burning. Uh, there are not a lot of actual battles on the march. There's um, one major battle in Georgia, the Battle of Griswoldville. There's a couple of battles in North Carolina. Bentonville and Aversboro, but in many ways this is not a traditional military campaign. And ultimately, they wind up outside of Durham at a farm known as the Bennett Place, the Bennett Farm, where Joe Johnston surrenders his Confederate army to Sherman in late April, so a couple of weeks after Lee's army has surrendered and Lincoln has been assassinated. How much devastation was really caused by Sherman's march? Sherman estimated $100 million worth of destruction in Georgia alone, and that is $100 million, $1864. Um, so a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, probably the same amount in South Carolina and North Carolina. They also freed many thousands of African Americans. Nobody knows how many. It's clearly the greatest army of liberation in the war. The, the closest way I could figure it out was I went back to the census and I looked, and the counties that Sherman passed through had a, an aggregate total of about 400,000 enslaved African Americans in 1860. So certainly we know that Probably about 25,000 African Americans wind up following Sherman as he marches through Georgia, and we can guess similar numbers in the Carolinas. What I do in the book, very quickly, is take this really kaleidoscopic approach to the march. So I look at the march from the perspective of Southern white civilians. I look at it from the perspective of African Americans whose experiences were very different. On the one hand, this is a moment of liberation for African Americans. On the other hand, they're often left to starve along with whites. It's a very complicated relationship, and we'll talk more about that, actually. Um, Sherman's veterans have a very different view of the march from the conventional one which is to say that they don't really talk about the destruction and devastation that they caused. They thought the march was great, that it was like a picnic. Um, they mostly talk about how much fun it was and how much there was to eat and drink. And this is um, actually by Thomas Nast, the famous cartoonist. It's called The Halt. And it is, I think it's my single favorite image of Sherman's march because it's just so preposterous, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. <laughs> On the best day, I don't think Sherman's march was quite this placid. <laughs> um, Sherman himself, I talk about uh, as a, a shaper of his own image through the writing of his memoirs and also how he was memorialized. This is uh, the Sherman statue in New York City outside of uh, Central Park and the Plaza Hotel. I talk about uh, how he's, he's both praised for his strategic genius and excoriated as often a merchant of terror. And then finally, because I know I'm almost out of time, I look at the march through all kinds of different cultural lenses. This is Walt Whitman, um, whose poem, Ethiopia Saluting the Colors, is about an African-American woman in North Carolina watching Sherman's men march by. Um, I look at popular music. I don't foolishly didn't put up an image of it. Oops, now I messed everything up. 
Um, but one of the uh, documents that I look very closely at is George Barnard, who was a photographer who published a book after the war called uh, Photographic Views of Sherman's Campaign, which we have in special collections if you would like to see it. It's really quite extraordinary to see the, the actual book. Um, and then I look at novels and films and so forth. So quickly, what does all this have to do with digital history? I wanted to do a digital project um, because, as, as Scott had mentioned, I had done digital work in graduate school. I knew I didn't want to build just an archive of documents because I had done that before. And so I went and talked to Dan Bailey at the IRC and I said, I want to do something where I look at these different kinds of stories and these different kinds of narratives. And what we came up with, uh, first talking to Dan and then Dan put me in touch with Kelly, is our website, Mapping Memory, which the basic, did that work? You show the website, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Usually it clicks over to it. How do I make that go away? Sorry. You'd think that, that I would know how to do this better after all these talks, or that I would know how to spell Sherman. <laughs> At shermansmarch.org. Get that URL, folks. Oh, did I spell it wrong? I did. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> OK, um, what we came up with were five different maps. And because why have one map? Um, these five maps it allow you to explore Sherman's March from five different perspectives. So, and Kelly will talk more about the maps. But briefly, there are the Sherman map, the sort of basic layer of facts, the civilian map, which allows you to explore stories from the perspective of Southern whites and also African Americans, a map about tourism and travel accounts, a map um, giving the perspective of soldiers along the march, soldiers and veterans. And based, this one's based off of a hand-drawn map. And then finally, one that we call it the fictional map, but it also incorporates music and poetry and allows you to see what um, creative works have, have been developed about Sherman's march. Um, Although my book covers the entire march up through the Carolinas, the website, for reasons of manageability, uh, only covers Georgia. And with that, I think I will stop and hand it over to Kelly Bell. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, I really appreciate it. I got a couple of other thank yous I'd like to tie on. This, this project has spanned over six years, much longer than Sherman's march. Uh, it has seen the changing of the guard at the IRC, I think, at least two times. Uh, it has had countless uh, artists, both in the undergrad program at UMBC and the graduate program here, uh, who contributed work to the website. Um, and also, I'd especially like to thank Shana Palmer, who's here tonight. She contributed, um, she contributed work to the Sherman's March site and also uh, did a lot of the programming for the cabinet, which um, I'm going to explain later. Uh, but the first thing I want to explain uh, is how, how I came to be here. Uh, when I moved to Baltimore uh, back in 1997, uh, there was a little TV show uh, that was running, that was, that was being filmed, that was called The Wire. And uh, I hadn't gotten my design practice up and running yet, so I had a friend of mine who was working in props and sets, and they said, oh, you know, if you won, I got a job for you. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, we're doing this set for a police commissioner's office. And we need fake diplomas, and we need <laughs> faked photographs, and we need faked certificates. And I said, I'm all about that. Um, so I did. I, I faked a diploma from Harvard. Uh, I faked numerous like certificates of honor from the city. If I had known it was this earlier, I would have saved a lot of money on college. <laughs> But one of the fun things I did get to do uh, was the, the, the character in question, and unfortunately I can't remember who specifically the character would, uh, was, had all of these photographs of uh, him shaking hands with uh, you know, the governor, like Lynn Denning, and all these other figures. And obviously the actor hadn't done this, and so I had to Photoshop out the head of whoever was shaking hands with Glenn Denning and put this guy's head in its place. So it was sort of this little switcheroo. And I had about 20 or so photos that I had to do, and I got to the end of the stack. 
and it was just this photograph of the commissioner shaking hands with the governor and then there was this guy kind of in the background and I thought oh you know I know what I'm gonna do so uh, so what I did was I I'd switched the heads as I was supposed to uh, but then I put my dad's face uh, in one of the photographs because he was also sort of a generic white guy so I just sort of figured why not and my father is immortalized oops wait <gasps> it's not clicking uh oh Oh, oh, there we go. So there you can see it. Uh, this is actually how I started watching The Wire, was I wanted to get a screen grab of my dad's face. Uh, so that very weird pale pink blob in the background of that photo <laughs> is my father, <laughs> memorialized forever. So Dan knew that I was good at faking things. Um, so he, he got me in touch with Anne and said, you know, this, this might be a good pairing. Uh, for you to work with and he was absolutely right because um, up, up until that time uh, in my design practice I was working with a lot of uh, arts-based nonprofits uh, in the Baltimore area and so I was spending a lot of my time making things look like something else um, and this is sort of at, at face value this might be sort of a cynical way of thinking about graphic design and sort of how graphic designers work um, but in some cases, this is really more about mastering a visual language. Uh, for example, you can see on the far right there, uh, the blue poster, uh, Warren Fleas, uh, which was a water ballet uh, that was a, <laughs> a canine-based water ballet <laughs> about uh, Dostoevsky's uh, War and Peace. Um, so they asked me to do that, and um, you know what I did was draw from um, sort of the artwork of that time. Okay, so even though we're sort of talking about Napoleonic era, people understand Russian constructivism, and when they see these sort of posters and see this sort of typography, they understand. Oh, okay, you're talking about Russia, right? So that's a lot of what a graphic designer's job is is to sort of master visual language and sort of understand how these parts, typography, imagery, even the words themselves, go together to create a larger context for people to understand stuff. So um, we went to work with the fellows. And um, the idea of maps, I think, was already on the table uh, when I came in. And this is one of the reasons that I was asked to come in was because you know we knew that you know some of these maps would serve a good purpose, but maybe some others would either have to be fabricated, or even maybe comp like you know sort of um, put together from other maps. And the first thing that I discovered is that the maps themselves have a wonderful visual language. Uh, even looking at the different samples that we've got here, we have you know maps that were drawn by hand, maps that were etched and hand colored, even maps that were sort of the first sort of the beginnings of photocopying. That last map there was done with a photographic process, essentially kind of think of it as like a big contact print. And this is how they would duplicate things back then. So there's all these different sort of visual languages to pull together in this project, and that's exactly what we did. So the first problem that we ran into was uh, the original map that we wanted to work with was the map that Sherman actually used on campaign. And uh, most of our maps were coming from the Library of Congress's American Memory Collection. They have a great collection of maps all about the Civil War. But uh, unfortunately, when we tried to actually put the scanned halves together, they didn't fit. So we actually had to use a map that was from 1865 that was sort of, or no, when was it? 18? Yeah, 65 that sort of commemorated the event. So it's sort of ex post facto, but hey, you know, it worked. The next problem that we had, though, as Anne showed you, we sort of had this onion skinning of maps, one on top of the other, because we really wanted people to understand that these narratives were all taking place at the same time. Different visual languages for each map pertaining to the person who's telling the stories on the map, and then also the master map as well. So for example, uh, this is the Sneeden map. I think that uh, Anne showed you that. And this is the original copy. So as you can see, that doesn't really fit onto our original map here. So a lot of my work and a lot of the IRCs, uh, the IRC interns that I was working with was replicating these maps so they would be able to onion skin properly and everything would be in registration, one layer on top of the other. Um, and this did involve 
a lot of fabrication. For example, a lot of the landmarks had to be moved around. So essentially what I did was <laughs> copy uh, specific, you know, specific areas on the map and then just move them into the places where they were supposed to be. And if a spot didn't exist, then I would just copy the handwriting and make it look like it did. Uh, so, you know, and, and it, those of you who are historians who are out there may be raising eyebrows like, hmm, well, this isn't really a history. But it is. It's just, it's a different kind of history. You know, there's, there's a saying, um, the map is not the territory. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. We're not necessarily, we are talking about history, but we're also talking about memory. Okay, memory is something that can squish and compress and expand, just like we did with these maps. So actually, the maps end up being a pretty, a pretty good metaphor. In terms of where we got a lot of the inspiration uh, for, you know, for the films that were featured on the website, um, you know, it came from a lot of things. And I think that that was something that I really enjoyed about this project was really getting my hands dirty, uh, sometimes literally. Uh, with a lot of different stuff. One, one of the things that we did actually was take a trip uh, down to Savannah. Uh, and this is uh, Fort McAllister. Uh, so this was sort of the, the last stop on Sherman's March, if you will, before he headed, uh, before he headed north. And it had like this little, um, this little museum in it. And in the museum there was this uh, diorama. Uh, so you, you basically, I mean, someone just took, you know, out of the box toy soldiers and kind of got a railway set and then actually, you know, started, you know, putting them in weird positions and things, but sort of creating this diorama of the events that happened at Fort McAllister. So I saw this and I, I just, I really liked it. I was just sort of like, oh, like you're using toys to sort of describe this thing that is really terrible. Like you're using toys to describe war. That's so neat. Uh, so for one of the films, uh, we were talking about Milledgeville and the story of Milledgeville was basically that these soldiers, and you have to remember the soldiers were very young, you know, maybe 18, you know, sort of around that area. And so when they came to Milledgeville, they found basically the town was deserted. Um, and they just began to play. Like they pretended to have like a, se a session of the Senate, and you know, they poured molasses all over the town. And so, you know, I was like, well, this is perfect. You know, play for war, so war for play. Like, you know, it just completely makes sense. So. Uh, <laughs> your money at work. Uh, we bought over 200 toy soldiers, uh, and um, unfortunately, you know, they were color coded. Uh, so we had sort of the gray for the Confederates and the blue for um, for the Yankees, and we just sort of spray painted all of them blue, <laughs> which was quite effective actually. And and the thing that I found really interesting um, in doing the research and sort of looking for the materials for uh, for the film was there are these websites that basically you can get any conflict um, as a toy set. Like here we have the Battle of Guadalcanal, um, you know, done in perfect, you know, HO scale, complete with uh, casualties and bomb craters um, and all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, this is a business. This is something that, you know, people take very seriously and collect. Um, so I was just getting more and more fascinated about this. And so when we came to sort of the time that we had to destroy Milledgeville. Um, I decided that, you know, I really wanted to go about it the right way. Uh, so I was working with some interns at the time when we actually literally bought, uh, built a Milledgeville out of cardboard uh, and then burned it. You can sort of see, originally we actually just set fire to them and that didn't really work. As you can see, it just sort of turned into a long ribbon of ashy muck. So we actually had to go in and burn them with a blowtorch to sort of, you know, really get nice targeted burns. Um, but the overall effect that we got um, was, was, was pretty effective. And then the way that we filmed it was very, very different. Um, these are all stills that we used uh, in the production. And um, really a lot of it has to do with cinematic language in terms of a close-up shot versus a long shot versus, you know, even silhouetting characters. I mean, sort of using the visual language that's applied to something big a movie that you see on the screen, but applying it to something really small, okay? So you get this weird kind of cognitive dissonance um, that, you know, makes it actually when you look at it. <laughs> I remember we were, we were going through this and we were looking at the photos and, and, you know, 
it, we were just like throwing molasses everywhere and setting stuff on fire. Uh, and I turned to one of the interns and I was just sort of like, I feel really wrong about this, like in, in a very strange way. Because when you start looking at things on this micro scale, things really begin to change. Um, the other one that I want to talk about, and this was sort of, again, part of our Savannah trip, uh, was Ebenezer Creek. And uh, Ebenezer Creek was one of the low points of the march. Um, this was sort of towards the end of the march, and Sherwin was being followed by you know, this group of slaves, many slaves, sort of following the army because they, were, they didn't want to get caught by the South. So they came to Ebenezer Creek, and this was really close to Savannah. The army crossed over a pontoon bridge. The general cut the ropes, and so all these slaves were left on the opposite bank. They decided that they would rather try to swim than get caught by the Southern, uh, by the southern cal Calvary, and many of them died going into the river and drowned to death. Okay. So it's not, it's not a fun place. So naturally, we went there to go take pictures. Um, we were at the boating ramp, and I'm gonna, the this, this story is told on the website, so I'm just going to tell a truncated sort of version of it, which is uh, we were there. I had this giant, very expensive camera, uh, and there were these guys sort of fishing you know, off of the stock. And Anne engages one of them in conversation, and the guy, all Southern hospitality, says, oh, you know what, I'm going to get my boat, and I'm going to take you into the swamp, because this isn't really where it happened. Where it happened is about you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes away. And so I see this guy walk off, and I'm just thinking, no, like this, no, 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 no. This is a really, really bad idea. <laughs> Anne, please. Um, so so I, I was going through the material, uh, and I actually found, I, I, I accidentally left the camera running uh, when we had a conversation about this. So this is a really neat little bit of ephemera. I want to make sure. So I, I provided subtitles. Oh, wait. Let me get those for you, Ben. So <laughs> me and Anne and the camera all get in the boat together. Uh, and, and this is actually a really nice note um, to leave you on uh, because it was an amazing trip. Uh, you know, it was just so silent and quiet. And, you know, the boat ramp, you really didn't get an idea of, you know, what these people were up against. But once you really got into the bayou and sort of saw these cypresses, these trees that look like dinosaur feet, um, and just how quiet it was, and this water that was as black as tea, you know, you really understood, you know, what, what was going through these people's mind. And it was an amazing experience. Um, how, much, how much time do I have left? Two? OK. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. Oh my god, I don't know what this, oh. Whew. I was going to talk about um, Gone with the Wind, but um, I want some time to talk about the cabinet. OK, the cabinet. So the cabinet is the thing uh, that you see here over to the left. Uh, and this is actually a direct result uh, of my work with the IRC fellows uh, that happened last spring. Um, this is an interactive cabinet. Essentially, I had IRC fellows uh, prepare films uh, for the website, which you guys can go out and check. But I kind of wanted them to have something else besides Thank you for your films. They're in the website. You're done. Uh, so I sort of created this cabinet of curiosities. So, so what you see here um, is a number of relics 
um, that were bought on Amazon and tagged. Uh, and they all have these RFID tags. And you guys are welcome to go and try this uh, once I'm done speaking. Um, so each of these objects tell us, tells a story. So you scan the tag, and then you get a movie that sort of explains an event that happened on Sherman's March. And, and I think actually this is, a, this is a really kind of a nice jumping off place for your guys' questions because you know, this really is about what I'm talking about, this, this tangible idea of research. You know, I wouldn't have understood what happened at Ebenezer Creek as deeply as I did if I didn't take time to go there and see how amazing it was. Well, amazing might be a bad word, but I assume that you take my meaning. You know, with Milledgeville, I wouldn't have really understood you know, what, like that sort of horrible feeling, the sacking and destruction of a town, if I didn't actually roll my sleeves up and do it myself. I'm not encouraging everybody to go and sack a town. <laughs> but, um, you know, g g in your research, like no matter what you're doing, you know, just take time to experience stuff. You know, especially because we see so much through this and through this, through screens, we're really losing contact with the tactile. And that's kind of what this is about, is sort of reconnecting the objects with the history. Okay? So please feel free to play with it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and we welcome your questions. Do you want to share the lab? Uh, no, I, I think I can just be that, Scott. <laughs> a quick, quick question that Jessica and I were hoping you would explain. What's on the website? Oh. <laughs> and the, the, kind of, the, the kind maps, of yeah, and the different. Okay, so there's what what's on? Yeah, Kelly, I'll pull it up. Well, what the website is, is are these five are these five maps, um, and then what you see are these is this very stylized representation of the two wings of Sherman's March, um, which is those red lines that draw. There's a time slider, so you can see where the march is for every day of the march. And then what the pins are, and we have to flip over the computer too. Oh, okay. uh, actually, I can do it from here. What the pins are. Oh, here, I, I got it. Oh, sorry. So keep talking. Um, the pins are, are like you'd stick a pin in a map, you know, to show that you've been there. And what they tell you is that there's a story about that place. And um, about 20 pins spread across the five maps have these mini documentaries, these films that Kelly was talking about. And then originally we were gonna have them for everything. We realized that was never, we'd never finish. Um, and then the rest of them have just a smaller vignette, a few paragraphs, an image. Um, I put one up today that's a uh, Herman Melville poem about the march. Um, but at any rate, they're basically sort of tied to places. And the idea is that for some places we only have one pin but for other places like Milledgeville, the antebellum capital, there's a pin on every map. And so you can see what happens in Milledgeville, but from very different perspectives. So that's, that's what you get. Oh, there's also a blog, a day-by-day -day blog that I have been doing for the duration of the march. So it started on November 15th. Um, the, the Georgia section of the march is over. Um, by late January, but then I'm going to keep the blog going up through the Carolinas and actually all the way up until they march in the Grand Review of the Union Armies at the end of May in Washington, D.C. Sure. Any other questions? Susan? Um, can you talk a little bit about the collaboration, sort of how you approach this as a historian and as a graphic designer? Um, because it's not, I'm a historian, and it's not the usual model of how we do things, and I'm totally fascinated. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think that's kind of the point. Um, <laughs> I don't know why we're always tiny, but... That's kind of... for the camera. Oh, okay. So, we can hear Okay. <laughs> clumsy anyway. Uh, that was kind of the point. Uh, you know, in, in talking to the IRC at the inception of the, of the, in the inception of the pro, uh, project, um, you know, we didn't want this to be like another Dan Brown sort of, you know, panning. Oh, Dan Brown. Ken Burns. Ken Burns. <laughs> oh, I get that. Oh, that would be fascinating. Um, so there's a lot about the Masons, actually, in yeah. Sherman's March. So, you know, we, we didn't want it to just be panning over a bunch of different photographs. So the storytelling, the digital storytelling part of it, really does you know, 
come into it. So, you know, it's subjective, like we understand that. So as opposed to sort of trying to say like, oh, well, forget that it's subjective, like this is history and this is fact. We went the other way and just sort of, you know, since we're looking at five different viewpoints of this map, we really wanted to push that subjectivity as much as possible. I think from the, the perspective of a historian, um, what I found sort of interesting and challenging all at once was, was the, you write really differently for visual media than you write in a book. And, and as someone, I, I'm a kind of wordy writer. I love, I love a clause and followed by another clause preferably. <laughs> um, and I realized you can't write that way for these scripts. Um, and you have to write shorter, but the, the, the gift that you get in exchange is that there's a lot of descriptive work that you don't have to do because the imagery can carry a lot of the description. So I, I found that a really, it's a, it's a kind of writing and it, it just sort of, you use a different side of your brain, I guess. And, and that what was great about it was because I was also writing a book, it is a lot of the, the research is the same. It's just sort of repackaging it and thinking about how do you repackage your work for different audiences. I think Kelly might have found it frustrating because I was constantly saying things like, you can't use that because that's not historically accurate. <laughs> no, that picture's from 1887. No, no. So I think in some ways it was probably harder for Kelly. <laughs> it's just a canon, in. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not disparate. Like when, when I said, you know, Ken Burns. I, I mean, there, right. there is certain. Of course, there's room for approaches like that. But because we're really talking about memory, and because we're talking again about this use of visual language and the map as a metaphor, that's why we sort of felt it was appropriate to take alternative approaches to storytelling. And and the the films themselves are literally all over the map. I mean, in terms of stylistically in terms of the media that's used. I mean, we have the film that I did with the Toy Soldiers. There are ones that are fully animated. There are some that are photo collage. So you know, that's kind of the interesting thing is you have all these different textures. Peggy. So um, two questions. Who was the photo editor? And for Anne, with your blog, are you, st are you writing every day for the blog? Um, it's a it's a cheater's blog because it's all primary sources, so I don't actually have to write anything myself, but I have to find it. <laughs> and even that is is hard enough. You know, I, I've been kind of thinking, wow, I picked a, I, I'm really going to do 195 days in a row. Ouch. So building on that, I mean, do you think about it, or have you thought about it as like performance? I don't think I've thought about it as performance. What I've thought about it is how do I get all the voices in? And how and you know, I could do it pretty easily if I just wanted it to be Sherman out of the official reports. And I actually found came across one the other day that is literally just that. It's just snippets from the official reports every day. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we get all the voices in, so um, you know, some of it does come from Sherman's memoirs, but it, some of it comes from soldiers' diaries. Some of it comes from Confederate women's diaries. Um, the hardest voices to get in are African American voices. Um, so I have some from slave narratives that are, are kind of keyed to a particular place. Um, I have a couple of kind of more like official pronouncements. I'm going to try and throw in some newspaper articles and things like that. But that's been tricky. And in terms of photo editor, I think we kind of both did it. I, you know, the, the interesting thing as a graphic designer for me with this part, um, and, and I was going to add this to the talk, but I'm glad I didn't because I ran out of time, was um, you know, we, we call this sort of the first modern war in America because of the technology that was involved, but also from a graphic design standpoint, um, you know, this is the first like age of mass media. Yeah. You know, you're looking at the introduction introduction of advertising, mass-produced periodicals, and printed propaganda for the war. Uh, so I got to know Harper's <laughs> very, yeah. very intimately. Uh, you know, there were sources that Anne had found already, such as the collection, the stuff from Special Collections. Um, and then there was a lot of just digging. Um, I, I gotta say, actually, with some of the animations, and, and this, this actually had nothing to do with you being persnickety, it's just <laughs> hard to, it's, it's hard to track down source material. And one thing that was really shocking, speaking about African Americans, was actually finding visuals of African Americans during the Civil War. The only thing that exists really is pictures of slaves 
and like really awful caricatures and that's it. Yeah. So, you know, it, it really, to find the perfect image for a particular film would actually take sometimes hours. Can you show us what the, what the chest does? The cabinet? Oh, yeah, sure. Show us what the sample? Okay, yeah. Um, I'll let you, you do the cabinet. Uh, this is the first time I've actually used scanner technology that has worked seamlessly. I'm so happy about it. Um, so each of these objects uh, has a tag on it. Um, these are the names of the guys actually who participated in the, um, who, who were in the IRC Fellows Program. Uh, so let's see, you got a favorite? Oh gosh, I don't even think I remember which keys to what. Um, uh, you know which one I like? I like the, the typography, the, the slave narrative typography okay, one. Yeah. What, I don't know what object it is. All right, so for yeah. example, so this is a, that's a good one. This is a silver spoon. This was a film that was done by uh, Angela Kim, who I think has since graduated. Um, and this is about uh, a slave and sort of the story that he has to tell about you know, when the bummers came to his plantation where he was a slave. I'm not sure if you guys are gonna get the audio on this. I'm gonna turn it up. But you can come back during the reception and-, and Yeah, you guys can play with this afterwards, but just so you see, actually, so, you know, it's just, it's, it's modern technology, guys. You just put, wait for the beep. I saw all of Wheeler's Confederate cavalry. Sherman came through first. He came and stayed all night. Thousands and thousands of soldiers passed through during the night. Cooper Cup was with him. He was a fellow that used to pedal around in that country before the war. He went through the South and learned everything. Then he joined up with the Yankees. He came there. Nobody saw him that night. He knew everybody knew him. He went and hid under something somewhere. He was under the hill at daybreak, but nobody saw him. When the last of the soldiers was going out in the morning, one fellow lagged behind and rounded the corner. Then he galloped a little ways and motioned with his arms. Cooper Cuck came out from under the hill, and he and Cooper Cuck both came back and stole everything that they could lay their hands on. All the gold and silver that was in the house and everything they could carry. <coughs> Wheeler's cavalry was about three days behind Sherman. They caught up with Sherman, but it would have been better if they hadn't, because he whipped them and drove them back and went right on. They didn't have much fighting in my country. They had a little scrimmage once. 36 men were all that were involved. One of the Yankees got lost from his company. He came back and inquired the way to Louisville. The old boss pointed the way with his left hand, and while the fellow was looking that way, he drug him off his horse and cut his throat and took his gun and killed him. Sherman's men stayed one night and left. I mean, his officers stayed. We had to feed them. They didn't pay anything for what they were fed. The other men cooked and ate their own grub. They took every horse and mule we had. I was sitting by my old missus. She said, please don't let them take our horses. The fellow she was talking to never looked around. He just said, every damn horse goes. The Yankees took my Uncle Ben with them when they left. He didn't stay but a couple of days. They got into a fight. He gave Uncle Ben five horses, five sacks of silverware, and five saddles. The goods were taken in the fight. Uncle Ben bought it back with him. The boss took all that silver away from him. Uncle Ben didn't know what to do with it. When Wheeler's cavalry came through, they didn't take anything. Nothing but what they ate. So, you know, and this is the thing I think that was really unique about the fellows, and then, and then I guess we should be shutting up. Um, this is, uh, it, when I was doing it, I had never taught the fellows before, uh, and I really just sort of decided to dump kind of creative freedom directly into the students' laps. I just said, look, here's the script, go. Um, no, in fact, they wrote the scripts. Yeah, you gave yeah, them Yeah, I the gave story. them the raw material. Yeah. I gave them my, my research notes. Yeah, so they, they wrote all the scripts, <laughs> came up with the treatment, did all the storyboards and everything. Um, and I remember just, you know, I originally made the decision, I was just like, oh God, please don't let them do, just don't let them do something awful because I won't be able to dissuade them from it. Um, but uh, all the approaches were rock solid. I, I, I gotta say, all, all seven of the films that we got uh, from that project just were really, really good. So I do invite you guys to, to take a look because there's, there's an approach 
Any approach you can think of to historical material is right here. Um, so that's it. I mean, unless, do we have more questions? Or? Way in the back. Yeah. Um, so I'm a student teaching with universities, and one of the big problems that I've occurred with the kids is they're like, you're lecturing about me, but I can't visualize it. Obviously, we can't take them to the Bayou to Savannah. Uh, how do you think we can get uh, projects like this out more into the public sphere to kind of make it more so we stop having that, you know, history versus memory dichotomy? I mean, the, the best way is just to use them, <laughs> them you know? I mean, well, you know, to use it is is the best way, and, and I would say there's so much out there. Oh my gosh, there's so much, and you know not all of it is great, but a lot of it is good, and especially in terms of if you just want to have the visual materials, the raw visual materials. Um, I mean, you know, there's the Library of Congress and and the. Digital Public Library of America, which which hooks you in with a lot of state libraries and state historical societies and things like that. Um, I mean, there's it's a at least for Civil War, there's really an embarrassment of riches. Um, yeah, I'd agree. Uh, Library of Congress is a great resource, and they're very intelligent about curating. Um, you know, that's the thing is it's not just sort of like here's the pictures. You know, that's yeah. it. Uh, you know, American Memory is actually a terrific digital resource, and most and they have a lot of lesson plans. The whole, they have teaching with primary sources, and I mean that's the, you know they're so. I think one thing is that that as we enter you know the probably I guess the third decade of this kind of digital revolution, right? You know, now that a lot of stuff has been scanned, now repositories are starting to say, okay, we have all this stuff. How do people use it? And I think there's been a real movement towards um, making it usable and digestible and saying, okay, like here's a packet of, you know, seven images and here's what you can do with them. And because again, especially if as a new teacher, you know, you can't reinvent the wheel every day. You need some, you know, some signposts and things like that. And also, I mean, I think metaphors work. You know, uh, I mean, the yeah. map sort of being the signature image, um, you know, makes the material a lot more accessible, right? Um, if you were just sort of presented with a bunch of articles that told the same story, you know, you wouldn't get it, I wouldn't read it, you know, and my <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, making one thing explain another um, is, is, another, is another strategy, in, in, yeah. at least in terms of teaching, I think, as a whole. Like, not just about history, but just in, in, in terms of making material interesting. You know, if you can come at, at it sideways, if that makes any sense. Sometimes that's an interesting approach. Red sweater. Um, was your goal in Cranios <laughs> mainly for it to be um, an educational tool, or did you have other audiences in mind? Uh, in, in terms of the website itself? Yeah. Um, I got, you know, originally I was just sort of like, oh, you know, I'm going to produce these films and then I can ship them out to festivals or, you know, that sort of thing. But um, I quickly learned that actually a lot of the media that we created could not really be understood without context. Um, <laughs> some of the films, since remember, not me, but you know, different people on the map are sort of telling stories from right. different points of view. There are some points of view on here that could definitely get me into trouble. Uh, so you know, um, once I kind of established that, um, you know, I kind of then just resolved to just sort of stick to the history um, because you know it has to be understood in context. The context is the map. You know, and not a film festival or something like that. And I think that that actually, for me as a filmmaker and as a designer, kind of made my path towards producing the films a little bit clearer. Because I don't have a broad audience that I'm trying to talk to. It's just specifically talking about the march and sort of the march within the context of the website. So. And, and for me, I saw it as my initial audience was really more the sort of Civil War buff market. Like, the people who might not buy my book, but maybe if they saw this website would think, oh, that book could, could be good. Or, uh, I didn't really know. I mean, honestly, I, I mean, that's how I sort of thought of it from the start. But, but I also saw it, I mean, part of it I saw as just a sort of interesting intellectual exercise. And it wasn't really until we'd already started building the website 
that people, uh, Diane Lee, I remember, came up to us and said, this would be great for education. I was like, oh, I didn't even really think about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, one thing that we have talked about doing in, in, in conjunction with Drescher and Rachel Brubaker is doing a, a teaching with primary sources using this. So again, sort of coming up with some kind of lesson plans or teacher's guide to make this more digestible. Because it does sort of drop you into it without a whole lot of explanation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the lame answer is like, well, it's well meant for everybody. <laughs> um, which, that's just sort of lazy thinking on my part. Uh, but I, I think, you know, it, it is sort of targeted because there's so many different treatments to the stories. Like, it's, again, not just sort of a Ken Burns kind of slow pan over photographs, but really taking different approaches to storytelling that I think, you know, I think once you've got somebody hooked, I think that they would be into it. And we just launched today, so I can't really answer that question. And it's not quite finished. There, It'll be finished soon. There are, there are some empty points, but not nearly as many empty points as there used to be. Another six years, we should have it right. We'll, we'll end on that up note. Thank you all so much.